In this video, we're gonna cover the large intestine and the accessory organs of the gastrointestinal tract. The large intestine is where water is absorbed from the indigestible residues of the liquid chyme from the small intestine. It gets converted into semi-solid stool or feces that is then stored temporarily and allowed to accumulate until defecation occurs. The large intestine consists of the cecum, the appendix, the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. The large intestine can be distinguished from the small intestine by the following features. The large intestine has a larger internal diameter. It contains haustra, which are sacculations of the wall of the colon between the tenia coli. The tenia coli, which are three distinct longitudinal bands of muscle, and the omental appendices, which are small, fatty, omentum-like projections. The tenia coli are thickened bands of smooth muscle, and they run the length of the large intestine. These muscles have a tonic contraction, meaning they are contracted even at rest, that shorten the part of the wall um, of the intestine that they're associated with, and so the colon becomes saculated or baggy between the tenia where they're contracted, forming what's called the haustra. This diagram illustrates the tenia, the haustra, and the fatty omental appendices, which are characteristic of the colon and are not associated with the rectum. So in this diagram, there's the cecum, which is the first part of the large intestine. And then there's the ascending colon, and then the transverse colon, and then the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. The omental appendices are these small fatty-like projections. Then we can see the tenia coli muscle that runs the longitudinal length of the colon. And when they are contracted tonically, they create these pouches, which we call the haustra. We can see that the fatty uh, omental appendices are not part of the rectum. So the rectum is part of the large intestine, uh, but it's absent in uh, omental appendices. Where the colon bends, we have the right colic flexure. So where the ascending colon bends to create the transverse colon, there's the right colic flexure. And then the transverse coli bends again to become the descending colon, and that is the left colic flexure. There is no name where the descending colon turns to become the sigmoid colon, or where the sigmoid colon turns to become the rectum. The rectum then leads into the anal canal. The cecum is the first part of the large intestine. It's continuous with the ascending colon. It's a blind intestinal pouch, about 7.5 centimeters in length and breadth, and it lies in the iliac fossa of the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. If the cecum is distended with feces or gas, it can be palpable through the anterolateral abdominal wall. The cecum usually lies within two and a half centimeters of the inguinal ligament. It's almost entirely enveloped by peritoneum and it can be lifted freely. However, the cecum has no mesentery, so it's pretty free to move around in that area. Because of its relative freedom, it can be displaced from the iliac fossa, but it is commonly bound to the lateral abdominal wall by a cecal fold. The appendix, otherwise known as the vermiform appendix, vermis meaning worm-like, is a blind intestinal diverticulum that's about six to 10 centimeters in length. It contains masses of lymphoid tissue. It arises from the posterior medial aspect of the cecum, just inferior to the iliocecal junction. 
The position of the appendix is somewhat variable, but it's usually retrocecal, so it's usually behind the cecum. The cecum is supplied by the iliocolic artery, which is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery. The appendix is supplied by the appendicular artery, which is a branch of the iliocolic artery. Venous drainage from the cecum and the appendix flow through the iliocolic vein, which is a tributary of the superior mesenteric vein. Lymphatic drainage of the cecum and the appendix pass to lymph nodes in the mesoappendix. The mesoappendix is the uh, mesentery of the appendix, and to the iliocolic lymph nodes that lie along the iliocolic artery. From those lymph nodes, lymph is passed through lymphatic vessels to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. The nerve supply to the cecum and the appendix derives from both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves from the superior mesenteric plexus. The sympathetic nerve fibers originate in the lower thoracic part of the spinal cord and the parasympathetic nerve fibers derive from the vagus nerve. Sensory information from the appendix travels through sympathetic nerves to the T10 segment of the spinal cord. The colon has four parts, the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colons that succeed one another in an arch. The colon encircles the small intestine with the ascending colon lying to the right of the small intestine, the transverse colon superior and anterior to it, and then the descending colon to the left of it, and then the sigmoid colon inferior to it. The ascending colon is the second part of the large intestine. It passes superiorly on the right side of the abdominal cavity from the cecum to the right lobe of the liver. Then it turns to the left at the right colic flexure, otherwise known as the hepatic flexure. And this flexure lies deep to the ninth and 10th ribs and is overlapped by the inferior part of the liver. The ascending colon is narrower than the cecum and is secondarily retroperitoneal along the right side of the posterior abdominal wall. The ascending colon is usually covered by peritoneum anteriorly and on its sides. However, in approximately 25% of people, it has a short mesentery. The ascending colon is separated from the anterolateral abdominal wall by the greater omentum or the big fatty apron. The arterial supply to the ascending colon and the right colic flexure is from the iliocolic and the right colic arteries, which are branches of the superior mesenteric arteries. Venous drainage from the ascending colon flows through the iliocolic and the right colic veins, which are tributaries of the superior mesenteric vein. The lymphatic drainage passes first to the epicolic and the paracolic lymph nodes, and then to the iliocolic and intermediate right colic lymph nodes, and then from there to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. The nerve supply to the ascending colon is from the superior mesenteric nerve plexus. The transverse colon is the third largest and most mobile part of the large intestine. It crosses the abdomen from the right colic flexure to the left colic flexure, where it turns inferiorly to become the descending colon. The left colic flexure, which is called the splenic flexure, is usually more superior, more acute of an angle, and less mobile than the right colic flexure. It lies anterior to the inferior part of the left kidney, and it attaches to the diaphragm through a ligament. The transverse colon and its mesentery, which is called the transverse mesocolon, loop down and often go as inferior as the level of the iliac crests. The mesentery is adherent to or it's fused with the posterior wall of the omental bursa. 
The transverse colon is freely movable, so it can vary in its position, and it usually hangs to the level of the umbilicus, which is at the L3 vertebral level. In tall, thin people, however, the transverse colon could extend into the pelvis. The arterial supply of the transverse colon is mainly from the middle colic artery, which is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery. Venous drainage of the transverse colon is through the superior mesenteric vein, and lymphatic drainage of the transverse colon is to the middle colic lymph nodes, which in turn drain to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes. This diagram is illustrating the arterial supply to the large intestine and to the appendix. In A, we're looking at an overview of the arterial blood supply to the large intestine. So in A, we see the aorta, and we see both paired and unpaired branches from the aorta. So this first branch right here is called the celiac trunk, which we'll talk about later. And then we have these two branches here and here, uh, which are the renal arteries. Then um, the next branch is a single branch that's called the superior mesenteric artery. So superior mesenteric artery. And this artery, if we look at it a little closer here, It, it will branch into several different branches. So the uh, first branch that we see is the middle colic artery. So that's branching off from the superior mesenteric artery. And then we see the right colic artery. And then we see the iliocolic artery. So what we're seeing is that the superior mesenteric artery is supplying this ascending and transverse colon. Then there's another branch that branches off of the abdominal aorta, and that is called the inferior mesenteric artery. So we see that trunk right there, and that trunk branches into the left colic artery and the superior sigmoid artery and the sigmoid arteries. And so these arteries will supply the descending colon and the sigmoid colon. In the picture to the right, we see the arterial supply to the cecum. So the cecum is this pouch. It's the first part of the uh, large intestine. And we see that that blood supply is coming from the ileocolic artery to supply that cecum. The descending colon is retroperitoneal, meaning it's behind the peritoneum, between the left colic flexure and the left iliac fossa, and then it's continuous with the sigmoid colon. So the peritoneum covers the colon anteriorly and laterally, and then binds it to the posterior abdominal wall. So it's behind the peritoneum, making it a retroperitoneal organ. As it descends, the colon passes anteriorly to the lateral border of the left kidney. The sigmoid colon is characterized by its S-shaped loop of variable length. It links the descending colon to the rectum. The sigmoid colon extends from the iliac fossa to the third sacral vertebra, where it joins the rectum. The termination of the tinea coli muscle, which ends about approximately 15 centimeters from the anus, indicates the junction between the rectum and the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon usually has a long mesentery called the sigmoid mesocolon, uh, and therefore has a considerable freedom of movement, especially its middle part. The left ureter and where the left common iliac divides both lie retroperitoneal. 
So they're posterior to the apex of the root of the sigmoid mesocolon. The arterial supply of the descending and sigmoid colon is from the left colic and sigmoid arteries, which are branches of the inferior mesenteric artery. So at approximately the left colic flexure, a second transition occurs in the blood supply of the abdominal part of the alimentary canal. The superior mesenteric artery supplying blood to that part, the proximal part of the flexure, and the inferior mesenteric artery supplying blood to the distal part of the flexure occurs. If there is a surgical colon resection, you have to visualize the anastomosis between the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery right there to ensure a continuous blood supply. Venous drainage from the descending colon and sigmoid colon is provided by the inferior mesenteric vein, flowing usually into the splenic vein and then the hepatic portal vein on its way to the liver. We'll talk about the hepatic portal vein when we get to the liver. Lymphatic drainage from the descending colon and the sigmoid colon is first conducted through vessels passing to the epicolic and pericolic nodes and then through the intermediate colic lymph nodes uh, that follow along the left colic artery. And then lymph from these nodes pass to the inferior mesenteric lymph nodes that lie around the inferior mesenteric artery. The descending and sigmoid colon are supplied by sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. The sympathetic nerve supply of the descending and sigmoid colon is from the lumbar part of the sympathetic trunk via the lumbar splanchnic nerves, as well as the superior mesenteric plexus and the periarterial plexuses that follow along the inferior mesenteric artery. The parasympathetic nerve supply is from the pelvic splanchnic nerves through the inferior hypogastric pelvic plexus and nerves. These ascend retroperitoneal, so behind the peritoneum, from the plexus. We'll talk more about the autonomic nervous system in another video. The rectum is a fixed, primarily retroperitoneal, terminal part of the large intestine. It's continuous with the sigmoid colon at the level of S3. The junction is at the inferior end of the mesentery of the sigmoid colon. The rectum continues inferiorly as the anal canal. The rectum is supplied by the superior rectal artery, which is a branch of the inferior mesenteric artery, the middle rectal artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery, and the inferior rectal artery, which is a branch of the internal pudendal artery that is a branch of the internal iliac artery. Above the pectinate line, the anal canal receives autonomic innervation from the inferior hypogastric plexus. The pectinate line is a line that defines the superior two-thirds of the anal canal from the inferior one-third. It's a visible zigzagging line formed from the inferior aspect of longitudinal folds known as the anal columns or anal valves. Parasympathetic innervation will inhibit the tone of the internal anal sphincter to allow defecation to occur and it evokes a peristaltic contraction that allows defecation. Now we'll look at the accessory organs of the GI tract. We'll start with the spleen. The spleen is ovoid. It's usually purple, pulpy. It's about the size and shape of one's fist. It's relatively delicate, and it's considered the most vulnerable of the abdominal organs. The spleen's located in the suprolateral, so superior and lateral part of the left upper quadrant, or in the left hypochondrium region of the abdomen. And there it has protection of the ribs from the inferior thoracic cage. 
As the largest of the lymphatic organs, it will participate in the body's defense system as a site of lymphocyte proliferation where white blood cells divide and of immune surveillance and response where blood moves through the spleen and cells in the spleen uh, can, can determine whether the blood uh, has pathogens in it. Prenatally, the spleen is a hematopoietic organ, meaning it's an organ that forms blood. But after birth, it's involved primarily in identifying, removing, and destroying expended red blood cells and broken down platelets, and in recycling iron and a plasma protein called globin. The spleen serves as a blood reservoir, storing red blood cells and platelets, and to a limited degree, providing a sort of self-transfusion as a response to stress imposed by hemorrhage. So if your body starts hemorrhaging, the spleen will start releasing its stored blood to replace the blood that's lost. In spite of its size and the many useful and important functions it provides, it's not a vital organ, so it's not necessary to sustain life. The spleen is a soft, vascular mass with a relatively delicate capsule around it. The thin capsule is covered with a layer of visceral peritoneum that entirely surrounds the spleen except at the splenic hilum, where splenic branches of the splenic artery and vein enter and leave. The spleen is a mobile organ, and although it normally doesn't descend inferior to the costal or rib region, it rests on the left colic flexure. It's associated posteriorly with the ninth through the 11th ribs, and it's separated from those ribs by the diaphragm and the costodiaphragmatic recess. The costodiaphragmatic recess is that cleft-like extension of the pleural cavity between the diaphragm and that lower thoracic cage. The relations of the spleen are as follows. Anterior to the spleen is the stomach. Posterior to the spleen is the left part of the diaphragm, which separates it from the pleura and the lungs. And then inferiorly, to the spleen is the left colic flexure, which, it, which it's resting on, and then medially is the left kidney. The surface of the spleen up against the diaphragm is convexly curved to fit the concavity of the diaphragm. The close relationship of the spleen to the ribs is so that the ribs can protect the spleen uh, because it could be pretty detrimental if um, there's a rib fracture and that ruptures the spleen. That would cause a lot of hemorrhaging and blood loss. Normally, the spleen doesn't extend inferior to the left costal margin, so it's very seldom palpable through the anterolateral abdominal wall unless it's enlarged. When it is enlarged, to approximately three times its normal size, then it moves inferior to that left costal margin, and then you would be able to palpate it, especially when a person takes a deep breath. The spleen normally contains a large quantity of blood that's expelled periodically into the circulation by the action of the smooth muscle in its capsule. The large size of the splenic artery or vein indicates the volume of blood that passes through the spleen's capillaries and sinuses. The arterial supply of the spleen is from the splenic artery, the largest branch of the celiac trunk. It follows a tortuous course posterior to the omental bursa and anterior to the left kidney along the superior border of the pancreas. Between the layers of the splenorenal ligament, the splenic artery divides into five or more branches that enter the hilum. Venous drainage from the spleen flows through a splenic vein that's formed by several tributaries that emerge from the hilum. It's joined by the inferior mesenteric vein and runs posterior to the body and tail of the pancreas through most of its course. 
The splenic vein then unites with the superior mesenteric vein posterior to the neck of the pancreas to form the hepatic portal vein. The splenic lymphatic vessels leave the lymph nodes in the splenic hilum and pass along the splenic vessels to the pancreaticosplenic lymph nodes en route to the celiac nodes. The nerves of the spleen are derived from the celiac plexus. They're distributed mainly along the branches of the splenic artery. They are vasomotor in function, which means that they will cause the smooth muscles of those blood vessels to contract, which vasoconstricts those blood vessels. This diagram is illustrating the anatomy of the spleen. In A and B, we see the surface projection of the spleen. So let's take a bigger view of this. First, we'll look at the anterior view. So here's the spleen right here. So it's this purplish organ. The spleen is anterior to the stomach, so the stomach is right here. Posterior um, to the spleen is the diaphragm, which we can see right there, posterior to that. It separates it from the pleura, the lungs, and the ribs 9 through 11. Inferiorly, we have the left colic flexure, so that's right there where that transverse colon turns. Uh, to become that descending colon. And then medially is the left kidney. Uh, so that's going to be medially and as well as posteriorly. Then we can see the lateral view and we see how that spleen sits up pretty tight against those ribs, but it's divided by that diaphragm. This arrow is just indicating the posterior, uh, the position of that left colic flexure. That's just what that spleen is sitting on. Then if we look at the anterior view again, this picture is just illustrating where the hilum of the spleen would be, where the arteries, veins, and nerves enter into the spleen. Then if we look at an inframedial view. This is just the spleen uh, being isolated from the other pictures in this slide. We can see by the borders of the spleen. So we have the anterior border, um, the inferior border, and the superior border of the spleen. So anterior to the spleen and inferior, we have the colic area where it sits on that left colic uh, flexure. Then on the medial side, we have the renal area where it um, is going to be closer to the kidneys. And then superiorly, we have the gastric area um, and the stomach sits right behind that area of the spleen. And we can see the hilum area, which is on the anterior aspect of the spleen and the vessels that are entering and leaving. Then on the last picture, we can see the histology of the spleen. These are the internal structures of the spleen. The trabeculae are small fibrous bands that arise from the deep aspect of the capsule and they carry blood vessels to and from the parenchyma of the spleen, which is called the splenic pulp. This is basically the whole substance of the spleen. This diagram is illustrating the relationships of the spleen, the pancreas, and the extrahepatic biliary ducts to other retroperitoneal viscera. So retroperitoneal organs are partially or completely behind the peritoneum. And you can use the mnemonic SAD pucker to illustrate all of the organs that are retroperitoneal to help you memorize them. The S stands for the suprarenal glands or adrenal glands. The A stands for the aorta. That also stands for the inferior vena cava. So we put those two together. The D stands for duodenum. The P stands for pancreas. 
The U stands for ureter, C for colon, K for kidneys, E for esophagus, and R for rectum. So these organs are either completely or partially behind the peritoneum, behind the, um, the parietal peritoneum. So they're not enclosed in completely in the peritoneal cavity. So these organs are all retroperitoneal. Then we have organs that are what we call intraperitoneal. So they are completely enclosed within that parietal peritoneum. And those organs include the stomach, the spleen, the liver, the first and fourth parts of the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, and the transverse and sigmoid colons. The pancreas is an elongated accessory digestive gland. It lies retroperitoneal. It lies over uh, and across the bodies of the L1 and L2 vertebrae. It's on the posterior abdominal wall. So it lies posterior to the stomach and then between the duodenum on the right and the spleen on the left. The transverse mesocolon attaches to its anterior margin. The pancreas is both an exocrine gland, which is digestive, and it's also an endocrine gland. The exocrine gland secretes pancreatic juice, and the pancreatic juice contains amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates, lipase, which breaks down lipids, and proteases, which break down proteins. It also secretes nucleases, which break down nucleic acids. In addition to those enzymes, it also secretes a bicarbonate, which helps to make the uh, pH go a little higher than it was in the stomach. The stomach was 1.5 to 2.0 pH, whereas um, the bicarbonate will bring that pH up and make it more alkaline to around four to five. As an endocrine gland, it secretes both glucagon and insulin. Together, these two hormones manage blood sugar levels. The head of the pancreas is the part of the pancreas that's embraced by that C-shaped area of the duodenum, and it's held down firmly to the duodenum. It's posterior to the inferior vena cava and the right renal artery and vein and the left renal vein. The neck of the pancreas is pretty short, and it's adjacent to the pylorus of the stomach. So there's the stomach, and then right here um, would be the pyloric portion of the stomach. So it's adjacent to that. The body of the pancreas right here is the largest part of the pancreas, and it is on top of the aorta. So it passes over the aorta and the L2 vertebra. The anterior surface of the body is covered with peritoneum, but the posterior surface of the body is not. Because of this, the pancreas comes in contact with the aorta, the superior mesenteric artery, the left adrenal gland, the left kidney, and the renal vessels. The tail of the pancreas is right here. 
it's close to the left colic flexure and it's a relatively mobile part of the pancreas. The main pancreatic duct begins in the tail of the pancreas and it runs through the parenchyma or the tissue of the gland to the parenchymal head. And from there it turns inferiorly and then it will be related to the bile duct. So the bile duct, we have the liver and then we have the gallbladder. The duct from the gallbladder is called the cystic duct. Then in the liver, there's a uh, right hepatic duct from the right lobe of the liver and a left hepatic duct from the left lobe of the liver and they come together to form the common hepatic duct. The cystic duct and the common hepatic duct join together to form the bile duct or the common bile duct. The common bile duct joins with the pancreatic duct at the hepatopancreatic ampulla. This ampulla opens up into the descending part of the duodenum. So here's the descending part, and then over here is the ascending part. So it opens up into the descending part of the ampulla. About 25% of the time, the ducts might open into the duodenum separately. There are three uh, sphincter muscles. There's a sphincter muscle for the pancreatic duct, and there's a sphincter muscle for the um, bile duct. And then there's also a sphincter muscle at the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And so these ducts uh, are going to prevent the reflux of contents from the duodenum back into these glands. Another name for the sphincter muscle of the hepatopancreatic ampulla is the sphincter of Odi or O-D-D-I. Um, but otherwise, that's just the sphincter of the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Of all of these ducts, only the bile duct plays a significant role in controlling the flow of digestive secretion or of bile into the duodenum. The arterial supply of the pancreas is derived mainly from the branches of the splenic artery. The splenic artery is markedly tortuous. There are also multiple arteries, pancreatic arteries, from pancreatic branches of the gastroduodenal and the superior mesenteric arteries. For example, the head of the pancreas is supplied by branches of the superior mesenteric artery and the gastroduodenal artery. Venous drainage from the pancreas occurs through corresponding pancreatic veins, which are tributaries of the splenic and the superior mesenteric parts of the hepatic portal vein. However, most of the venous drainage is into the splenic vein. Most lymphatic vessels end in the pancreatic co-splenic lymph nodes, which lie along the splenic artery, but some vessels end in the pyloric lymph nodes. All of the vessels from those lymph nodes will drain to the superior mesenteric lymph nodes or to the celiac lymph nodes. The nerves of the pancreas are derived from vagus nerves and abdominal pelvic splanchnic nerves that pass through the diaphragm. The parasympathetic fibers can cause secretion to occur, but most of the pancreatic secretion is primarily mediated by the hormones secretin and cholecystokinin, or CCK. These are hormones that are formed by the epithelial cells of the duodenum and the proximal intestinal mucosa under the stimulus of acids uh, from the stomach. So as soon as the stomach uh, acids start to be produced, it sends a message to the duodenum and the proximal intestinal mucosa, and then those mucosal cells are going to secrete secretin and cholecystokinin, both of which stimulate the pancreas to secrete enzymes for digestion. 
This diagram illustrates arterial supply and venous drainage of the pancreas. So let's first take a look at the arterial supply of the pancreas. This is the abdominal aorta, and it has the celiac trunk, which is the first real branch that comes off of the aorta just underneath that diaphragm. And one of the branches of the celiac trunk is the common hepatic artery. So that is going to supply, branches of that will supply the pancreas. And then we also have another one called the splenic artery. The splenic artery supplies the spleen, but there's also a branch that supplies the pancreas as well. And then there's the superior mesenteric artery, which is another branch off of the abdominal aorta, and it has branches that will also supply the pancreas. And we'll look at the venous drainage of the pancreas, and most of the pancreas will be drained by the splenic vein. So this is the splenic vein right here, although some of it will be drained by um, superior mesenteric parts of the hepatic portal vein. So here we see the superior mesenteric vein, and we can see that um, some parts or tributaries of the superior mesenteric vein are also draining the pancreas. This diagram is illustrating the lymphatic drainage and the innervation of the pancreas and spleen. So first we'll look at the lymph nodes, and we see a cluster of lymph nodes. Most vessels end in the pancreaticosplenic lymph nodes, which are right here, and that lies along the splenic artery. And then um, the efferent vessels from those nodes drain into the superior mesenteric lymph nodes, which are right here, or into the celiac lymph nodes, which are right here, and then those lymph nodes will drain into the hepatic lymph nodes. From there, lymph will be delivered to the cisterna chile, and then into the thoracic duct, and then eventually into the left subclavian vein. Next, we'll look at innervation. Innervation of the pancreas is derived from the vagus nerve, as well as from the abdominal pelvic splanchnic nerves. The nerves of the spleen are distributed along branches of the celiac plexus, and those branches follow along the um, splenic artery. The liver is the largest gland in the body, and after the skin, it's the largest single organ. Except for fat, all nutrients absorbed from the GI tract are initially sent to the liver by the hepatic portal system. The liver can then decide whether it should store the nutrients or release the nutrients out to the body. In addition to those metabolic activities, the liver also stores glycogen, which is stored sugar, and it secretes bile, which is a yellow, brown, or green fluid that aids in the emulsification or breakdown of fat. Bile passes from the liver through biliary ducts. There is a right and a left biliary duct. So if this is our liver, there's a right biliary duct and a left biliary duct that come together to form the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct then unites with the cystic duct of the gallbladder. So here's the gallbladder, and there's the cystic duct right there. So the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct join together to become the common bile duct. Let's 
otherwise known as the bile duct. The liver produces bile constantly. And then between meals, it accumulates and will be stored in the gallbladder. So the um, bile, which is produced by the liver, will move through the cystic duct into the gallbladder to be stored. And there it will also be concentrated. And when food arrives in the duodenum, the gallbladder will contract and send that concentrated bile through the ducts into the duodenum. Externally, the liver is divided into two anatomical lobes and two accessory lobes by reflections of peritoneum from its surface. These superficial lobes are not true lobes as the term is generally used because these indentations are more external and they don't go all the way through the organ dividing it into true right and left lobes. The midline plane of the liver is defined by the attachment of the falciform ligament, and this fissure divides a large right lobe from a much smaller left lobe. The two accessory lobes are part of the anatomic right lobe, and they include the quadrate lobe, which is anterior and inferior, and the caudate lobe, which is posterior and superior. The caudate lobe was named not because it's caudal, like the name implies, in position, but because it often gives rise to a tail in the form of an elongated papillary process. Even though the right and the left liver lobes are not separated internally, they still receive their own blood supply. The right and the left lobe each receives its own primary branch of the hepatic artery and its own primary branch of the hepatic portal vein, and each lobe also is drained by its own hepatic duct. The caudate lobe could be considered a third liver because its vascularization is independent of where the hepatic portal vein divides or bifurcates to supply the right and the left lobe. It's, it receives vessels from both of those bifurcations of both of those bundles. And then it is drained by one or two small hepatic veins. These hepatic veins directly enter the inferior vena cava, just distal to where the main hepatic veins directly uh, drain blood into the inferior vena cava. The liver lies mainly in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen. It's protected by the thoracic rib cage and the diaphragm. It's just tucked right up underneath that rib cage. The liver normally lies deep to the ribs seven through 11 on the right side and then crosses midline toward the left nipple. As far as where the liver is in the regions of the body, those nine regions, the liver occupies most of the right hypochondriac region and the upper epigastric region, and it extends into the left hypochondriac region. The liver moves with the excursions of the diaphragm. As the diaphragm is pushed down and up, the liver moves with it when the diaphragm contracts and relaxes. The liver is located more inferiorly when a person is standing because of gravity. It's easier to palpate the liver when a person is standing because the liver moves more inferiorly. The liver has a diaphragmatic surface and a visceral surface. The diaphragmatic surface or the surface of the liver on the diaphragm is smooth and dome shaped and it's related to the concavity of the inferior surface of the diaphragm. It separates the liver from the pleura, the lungs, the pericardium, and the heart, everything in the thoracic cavity. The subphrenic recesses are superior extensions of the peritoneal cavity that exist between the diaphragm and the anterior and superior aspects of the diaphragmatic surface of the liver. 
So here in this picture, we see the diaphragm, this red dome, and then we see the liver and the purple area then is showing that diaphragmatic surface. The orange line here is showing the visceral surface and where the visceral surface and the diaphragmatic surface come together anteriorly, it forms the inferior border of the liver. This subphrenic recess then, right here, that is an extension of the peritoneal cavity that exists between the diaphragm and the anterior and superior aspect of the uh, liver. The liver has a dual blood supply of blood vessels bringing blood to the liver. The hepatic portal vein brings 75 to 80% of the blood to the liver. This portal blood contains about 40% more oxygen than blood returning to the heart from the systemic circuit. And that oxygen will help to sustain the liver parenchyma or the liver cells, which are called hepatocytes. The hepatic portal vein carries virtually all the nutrients that are absorbed by the GI tract to the liver. The exception to this is lipids. Lipids are not absorbed into the hepatic portal vein. Instead, lipids are absorbed into and then bypass the liver through the lymphatic system. Arterial blood from the hepatic artery accounts for only 20 to 25% of blood that's received by the liver. And that's distributed initially to non-parenchymal structures, um, so not to the hepatocytes. Particularly, um, it will supply the bile ducts. The liver is the major lymph producing organ between one quarter and one half of the lymph that enters the thoracic duct comes from the liver. Most lymph is formed in the perisinusoidal spaces and drain to the deep lymphatics in the surrounding interlobular portal triads. Superficial lymphatics drain into the hepatic lymph nodes, then into the phrenic lymph nodes, or they join deep lymphatics and then drain into the posterior mediastinal lymph nodes, then into the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. So ultimately, all the lymph drains into the posterior mediastinal lymph nodes and then into the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. The nerves that innervate the liver are derived from the hepatic plexus, which is a large derivative of the celiac plexus. The hepatic plexus accompanies the branches of the hepatic artery and the hepatic portal vein to the liver. This plexus has sympathetic fibers from the celiac plexus, and it has parasympathetic fibers from the vagus nerve. This diagram is illustrating the peritoneal and the visceral relationships of the liver. So first we will look at an anterior view of the liver and we see the larger right lobe and the smaller left lobe. The liver sits on the right side and it extends over uh, onto the left side. There's the falciform ligament that divides those two lobes superficially. And then we have the coronary ligament, which is a ligament that attaches the liver to the diaphragm. And we have a picture over here that looks like a book and this is um, showing the peritoneal reflections. So the, in this picture, the attachments of the liver are cut through and the liver is removed from its site and it's placed on the specimen's right and is turned posteriorly, like if you're turning the page of a book. So we're looking at a posterior view as well as an anterior view. So on the posterior view, we see the bare area where there's no peritoneum. We can see the caudate lobe. We can see that on the posterior side, the inferior vena cava runs behind it. And we can also see the lesser omentum. On an anterior view, we see that the liver is sitting behind the stomach. So it's um, the left lobe 
is behind the duodenum of the stomach. And just to the left of it, we see the inferior vena cava. Then if we look down here, we're looking at a posterior and inferior view of the liver. So we can see the caudate lobe, which is right here. We can see the quadrate lobe, which is right here. Here's the inferior vena cava. And then we see the blood vessels, the portal vein, which is delivering blood from the intestines. And uh, we see the um, hepatic duct from the liver and the cystic duct from the gallbladder. And they come together to form that common bile duct. Then over here, we see a superior view. So we're looking at the top of the liver and so here we can see these hepatic veins that are draining into the inferior vena cava. Finally, we can see a lateral schematic of the gravity-dependent recesses. So this schematic is showing where fluid would accumulate in a patient that's laying supine. There's two different re recesses. There's a rectovesical pouch or rectouterine recess, and there's a hepatorenal recess. This diagram is showing the visceral surface of the liver. So we see the anatomical lobes. There's the left lobe and the right lobe, and there's the caudate lobe, and there's the quadrate lobe. These four anatomical lobes of the liver are defined by external features, which are um, the fissures in between those lobes and not by internal features. And then we see structures that form and occupy the fissures of the visceral surface. So the inferior vena cava lies in the right sagittal fissure and the gallbladder lies in the right sagittal fissure as well, more inferior. And then the portal vein and the hepatic artery and bile passages are going to go through the uh, fissure between the quadrate lobe and the caudate lobe. And this fissure is called the porta hepatis. This diagram is showing how three planes or fissures can divide the liver into four vertical divisions and each one of those divisions are served by a secondary branch of the portal um, system. The three divisions can then be further subdivided into hepatic segments. Each segment has its own intrasegmental blood supply and biliary exchange. The liver contains lobules, and um, those lobules consist of a central vein and then uh, these sinusoids and these hepatocytes that radiate outward like the spokes of a wheel. And then in these lobules are these hepatocytes and the hepatocytes are the cells of the liver. Hepatocytes secrete bile into bile canaliculi, which are small canals. The, can the canaliculi then drain into these small biliary ducts and then into the right and the left hepatic duct. The hepatic ducts then merge to form the common hepatic duct, and then the common hepatic duct joins the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. Then the bile duct delivers bile to the duodenum. This diagram is illustrating the flow of blood and bile in the liver. So in the top picture, we're just seeing a liver lobule this is a small part of the liver lobule that illustrates the components of what's called the portal triad and the positioning of the sinusoids, which are capillaries and the bile canaliculi. So we have the hepatic portal vein that's delivering nutrients from the intestines. And then we have the hepatic artery, which is delivering um, blood, oxygen-rich blood. And then we also have the biliary duct. 
Together, the hepatic portal vein, the hepatic artery, and the biliary duct form the portal triad. There's also specialized macrophages in the liver that are called Kupfer cells. They defend the liver against pathogens or foreign uh, cells. And each one of these cells of the liver are called hepatocytes. Hepatocytes are the cells that produce bile and they also detoxify blood. Bile flows from the hepatocytes into the bile canaliculi and then into interlobar biliary ducts and then into the bile duct in the extrahepatic portal triad. Then if we look at this picture down here, we see the flow of blood and bile in the liver. So we have the cystic duct, which is right here. And we have the um, right and left hepatic ducts that join together to form the common hepatic duct, which is right here. And then the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct join together to become the bile duct or the common bile duct. And then the common bile duct um, will join with the main hepatic duct at the hepatopancreatic ampulla, which is right here, and we have all those sphincter muscles in there to prevent the backflow um, from the duodenum into those organs. Over here, we see the actual ampulla, the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And so here's the bile duct joining with the pancreatic duct to become the hepatopancreatic ampulla. And there's sphincters at each area. The bile duct, which is formally called the common bile duct, forms in the free edge of the lesser omentum by the union of the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. The length of the bile duct varies. It can be anywhere from five to 15 centimeters, depending on where the cystic duct joins the common hepatic duct. The bile duct then runs obliquely along with the main pancreatic duct and it unites at the hepatopancreatic ampulla. The sphincter of the bile duct is smooth muscle, so it's involuntary, and when it contracts, bile can't enter into the hepatopancreatic ampulla. The gallbladder is about seven to 10 centimeters long, and it lies in the fossa for the gallbladder on the visceral surface of the liver. It's a shallow fossa that lies at the junction of the right and the left parts of the liver. The relationship of the gallbladder to the duodenum is so close that the superior part of the duodenum is usually stained with bile in the cadaver, so it looks green. The gallbladder is pear-shaped. It can hold up to 50 milliliters of bile. It has three parts to it, the fundus, which is the wide blunt end that usually projects from the inferior border of the gallbladder. It has a body, which is the main portion that contacts the visceral surface of the liver, as well as the transverse colon and the superior part of the duodenum. Then there's the infundibulum, which is the narrow tapering end that's opposite the fundus and directed towards the porta hepatis, and then the neck, which typically makes a simple or an S-shaped bend as it joins the cystic duct. The cystic duct connects the neck of the gallbladder to the common hepatic duct. The mucosa of the neck spirals into a spiral fold or a valve, a spiral valve. This spiral valve then helps to keep the cystic duct open so that bile can easily be diverted into the gallbladder when the distal end of the bile duct is closed. The gallbladder is supplied by the cystic artery and it is drained by the cystic vein. The cystic artery uh, commonly arises from the right hepatic artery. The hepatic portal vein is the main channel of the portal venous system. This system is formed anterior to the inferior vena cava 
and posterior to the neck of the pancreas. The hepatic portal vein is created by the joining of the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic veins. In approximately one third of individuals, the inferior mesenteric vein will join the um, superior mesenteric and splenic veins. So all three veins would form the hepatic portal vein. But in most people, the inferior mesenteric vein enters the splenic vein and then the splenic vein joins the superior mesenteric vein. Although the hepatic portal vein is a large vessel, it only runs a very short course, most of which is contained within a ligament called the hepatoduodenal ligament. And as it approaches the porta hepatis, the hepatic portal vein divides into right and left branches. The blood in the hepatic portal vein has reduced oxygen but because it's a vein, but it's very rich in nutrients because it's just picked up nutrients from the abdominal part of the uh, GI tract, including from the gallbladder and the pancreas and from the spleen as well. And then it carries all those nutrients to the liver. Blood from the spleen carries the products of red blood cell breakdown from the spleen and that passes mostly to the left lobe of the liver. Blood from the superior mesenteric vein, which is rich in absorbed nutrients from the intestines, passes mostly to the right liver. And then within the liver, its branches are distributed in sort of a segmental pattern. The portal system anastomoses are where the portal system communicates with other veins in the systemic venous system. This diagram is illustrating the arterial supply of the biliary duct and the lymphatic drainage of the gallbladder and the bile duct. The lymphatic vessels of the gallbladder and the biliary passages anastomose superiorly with those of the liver and then inferiorly with those of the pancreas. Most drainage flows to the celiac lymph nodes. The arrows are showing the direction of lymph flow. This diagram is illustrating the nerves and the veins of the liver and the biliary system. Nerves are prominent along the hepatic artery and the bile duct and their branches. The sympathetic nerve supply is vasomotor, meaning it will cause constriction of the blood vessels in the liver and the biliary system. The veins of the gallbladder neck communicate with the cystic veins along the cystic and biliary ducts. So the gallbladder has the cystic duct that joins the um, common hepatic duct, uh, which forms the bile duct. By following the dotted lines, you can see the sympathetic nerves and you can also see the parasympathetic nerves. So the sympathetic nerves are in blue and the parasympathetic nerves are in red. This is a schematic of a sagittal section that's just showing the relationship to the superior part of the duodenum. So here's the duodenum and then right above that we have the cystic duct and that leads into the gallbladder and then um, superior to that, we have the right and, hepat right and left hepatic ducts in the porta hepatis, uh, and they join together to form that common bile duct. This diagram is illustrating variation in the origin and course of the cystic artery. A is a more common uh, pattern, 75.5%. C would be the next common um, most common pattern, and then B is, is pretty rare. So we'll study the cystic artery. And so uh, in the most common scenario, the common hepatic artery branches into the hepatic artery proper, and that divides into the right and the left hepatic arteries. This diagram is illustrating the tributaries of the hepatic portal vein and the portal uh, systemic anastomoses. 
So we're looking at an overview here. We see the superior mesenteric vein that joins with the splenic vein to create the hepatic portal vein. And the inferior mesenteric vein, which is right here, joins the splenic vein before the splenic vein joins the superior mesenteric vein. We can also see how these veins are anastomosing with other organs. And the anastomoses provide a collateral circulation in case there's an obstruction in the liver or in the portal vein. Here, the portal tributaries are darker blue and the systemic tributaries are a lighter blue. When a spleen is diseased, like in granulocytic leukemia, it can become enlarged to 10 or even more than 10 times its size. The spleen's usually not palpable, um, but if the lower edge can be palp palpated, and that would be on the left side underneath the rib cage, um, it can be palpated if it's enlarged three times its normal, that would indicate that there's some disorder going on. Now the spleen can be palpated during mononucleosis. That's, an, that's a common time for the spleen to be enlarged. Uh, the spleen can also be enlarged with hemolytic anemia or with granulocytic anemia. Cancer involving the pancreatic head accounts for most of the cases of extrahepatic obstruction of the biliary ducts. This cancer can obstruct the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and that can result in an enlargement of the gallbladder as it backs up and even um, cause obstructive jaundice where the skin turns yellow. Most people with pancreatic cancer have ductular adenocarcinoma. And with this, uh, they're gonna get severe pain in the back. And that's because the pancreas is retroperitoneal and the cancer usually metastasized to the liver through the hepatic portal vein. A procedure called the Whipple procedure is the main surgery for cancer in the pancreas and the biliary tract. And in this procedure, the head of the pancreas is removed, part of the duodenum is removed, and the gallbladder is removed. Both the inferior vena cava and the hepatic portal veins lack valves. So they don't have the valves that prevent the backflow of blood. So any rise in central venous pressure backs up into the liver because there are no valves to stop it. This causes the liver to enlarge, which we call hepatomegaly. The fibrous capsule of the liver enlarges and the patient experiences pain around the lower ribs, which is in the right hypochondriac region. Uh, a patient will say they have a runner's stitch when the liver is enlarged, it can be palpated under the right costal margin and maybe even down to the pelvic brim in the right lower quadrant. Portal hypertension is when there's an increase in pressure uh, in the hepatic portal vein. This can be caused from scarring or um, fibrosis uh, from cirrhosis of the liver. When this happens, blood backs up and the veins of the hepatic portal vein dilate and can even rupture and this can cause hemorrhage. In severe cases of portal obstruction, the veins of the anterior abdominal wall can become varicose and they will look like small little snakes radiating from the skin around the umbilicus. And because of this, uh, that condition is called caput medusae or head of the medusa. So this ends this video on the large intestine and the accessory structures.